1863, Sigler was court-martialed in Louisiana on multiple charges, which included disobedience of orders and unofficer-like conduct. He was acquitted of charges, uh, but it is a good indicator of the downward spiral of his career by 1863. And they mentioned, I have read the court-martial papers, and he even mentioned the fact that he was drunk uh, during some of the battles. But on the right side, I want to be completely negative about the man who lost the Civil War for the Confederacy. He uh, patented a teepee, uh, a tent referred to as the Sibley Tent. And it was used mostly all over the North uh, by Northern troops. And since uh, the Confederacy had split away from the North, poor Henry Sibley didn't get any royalties from the sales of the tent. But it was used throughout the Civil War. And which brings us to number one, which is John Bell Hood. And I know there are John Bell Hood advocates. There may be some in the audience. I will make my case. Uh, please wait till the end of my presentation if you would like to throw anything at me. He himself as a brigade corps commander in 18 of Chickamauga, seven days, second battle of Bull Run. He was personally brave. He was seriously injured twice, <coughs> once in Gettysburg with his arm, and once in Chickamauga where he lost his leg. But he continued to serve. First two and a half years of the war, he's one of the great offensive division commanders of the war. Uh, even up to being a corps commander, uh, he's pretty impressive. But his performance as a commander of an army was among the worst of the Civil War. The uh, Peter principle of being uh, promoted to the level of your incompetency would seem to describe John Melvin. So he's a corps commander under Johnston during Sherman's Atlanta campaign. And the first thing, which was kind of an oops, is Johnston had laid a trap for Sherman's army in a place called Cassville. And it's sometimes called the Battle that Never Was. Because there was a crossroads uh, about five miles north of Cassville. And one part of it went west and the other went south to Cassville. And Johnston figured that when Sherman's army got to that crossroad, that Sherman would split it in half. Well, if Sherman split his army in half, if Johnston's whole army could face half of Sherman's army, he hoped to win. He sent John Bell Hood out, who was a corps commander, and he said, you watch this road, and eventually half the Union army is going to come down that road, and it's your job to attack them. John Bell Hood took his, uh, took his corps out there, 30,000 troops, and a uh, Union recon, a uh, cavalry recon group, probably a couple hundred soldiers, came down the road to, to see what was ahead during reconnaissance. John Bell Hood decided that that was the whole Union Army, and he immediately retreated back into Cassville, sending poor Joe Johnston into uh, a fit of apoplexy, now I'm actually making it up, but Johnston was very angry uh, that Hood retreated. So the trap was not uh, sprung, and uh, the, uh, the fight did not happen. During the whole Atlanta campaign, John Bell Hood had been sending nasty grants through email, through wireless email, but just making that part up, uh, to Davis and Richmond. He just kept sending letters to, to Davis about what an awful commander Joe Johnston was. And keep in mind that at one point, Joe Johnston was the head of the Confederate Army. When he got injured at Fair Oaks, that's when Robert Lee was put in charge of the Confederate Army. So Joe Johnston's a pretty good general. Uh, Davis listened and relieved Johnston on July 17, 1864. And guess who he gave the army to? He gave it to John Bell Hood. Now there is an irony here. John Bell Hood was always known as a great offensive general. Joe Johnston was known as a great defensive general. One was the swap man when they were at the gates of Atlanta and it had become an entirely a defensive battle uh, for the uh, for the South. So Hood is now in charge of the Confederate Army in the Deep South. And this is the best way that I can show what the impact of that was. So here's some of the battles under Johnston. Uh, Union Casualty, 6,800 to 5,200 of Osaka. New Hope Church, Union Casualties, 1,900 to 500 for the Confederates. Pickett's Mill, Union Casualty, 1,600 to 4,000 or 400. Kennesaw Mountain. 3,000 Union casualties to about 1,000 for the Confederates. This is under Joe Johnson. When John Bell Hood takes over, Peachtree Creek, Union casualties 1,800, Confederate 2,500. Battle of Atlanta, Union casualties 3,700, 
Confederate casualties, 7,000. Ezra Church, Union casualties, 600. Confederate casualties, 300. You can see, since the uh, Confederate force was half the size of uh, Sherman's force to begin with, that could not continue to absorb those kind of losses. So you can see the whole tide of the battle changed for the worse uh, for the Confederates. Uh, I'm not done with Hood yet, so those of you who are going to have defense of it, you need to hear the rest of this. Uh, after Sherman took Atlanta, Hood took his army into Tennessee, abandoned in Georgia with Sherman's army. So if you've ever got a man, Sherman from the Marsh to the Sea, keep in mind that the reason it, it was so easy for him is because Hood had left the state. Uh, in that part, with Hood gone, there was no organized Confederate resistance. So Sherman sent half his army up into Tennessee to fight against Hood. At a place called Franklin, Tennessee, who had ordered a charge across two miles of open terrain against Sherman's forces. Those troops were decimated, uh, three to one casualties in favor of the Union. And then finally, the Battle of Nashville, George Thomas won a decisive victory over Hood, uh, Union casualties, 3,000 to 6,000 for the Confederates. Nobody knows why Hood was such a good division commander and a pretty good core commander, but such an awful commander of the army. Well, if uh, any of you out there are now seething because I just spent the last 15 minutes talking about rotten generals in the Confederacy, we now get to the good ones. So we'll talk here about the good ones. So number five is a tie. The first uh, one I have listed is Patrick Claver, who actually served in the British Army, which made him fairly unique. He's sometimes called the Stonewall Jackson of the West. He fought with distinction at Stones River, Chickamauga, Chattanooga, and Missionary Ridge. At Missionary Ridge, he held off a vast and superior force under uh, none other than William Tecumseh Sherman. 1863, the Battle of Ringgold Gap, which is one of his great moments, Claiborne defended the Gap for five hours, allowing Bragg's Army of Tennessee to retreat successfully to Tunnel Hill. And Claiborne and his troops were recognized by the uh, the Confederate Congress for their efforts. Here's a, a Civil War drawing of the Battle of Ringgold Gap. And this is the uh, railroad depot in Ringgold. And you'll notice that the top, the stones are a different color than the bottom. The top of the depot was torn off during the Battle of Ringgold Gap. And when they rebuilt it, they used different color stone. Pickett's Mill, which I think is a masterpiece, doesn't get talked about a whole lot. May 27, 1864, he defeats a larger federal force uh, during the Atlantic campaign at Pickens, Pickensville, which is now a state park. Claiborne picked the perfect spot on the battlefield. He dug in at the top of a very deep ravine. The federals decided it was a good idea to try to fight uphill uh, the ravine against the entrenched federal uh, Confederate force. And uh, they ended up losing 1,600 men and only 400 for the Confederates. Pickett's Mill was such an anonymous loss for Sherman, he didn't mention it in his memoirs, and he uh, didn't get, ever, never got around to mentioning it in the official report of the war. Uh, the Battle of Kepsall Mountain, if any of you are familiar with Cheatham Hill, which was one of the great battles of that was fought, it was Patrick Claiborne and Ben Cheatham that held off George Thomas's uh, assault forces. And he also distinguished himself at the Battle of Jonesboro against much uh, great forces. He was a little controversial in 1864. It kind of looked like the war was going against the Confederacy. He proposed to the Army of Tennessee that, well, why don't we just emancipate all the slaves and then put a uniform on them and they can fight with us in, in the, the Army. And this proposal was never implemented, as you're probably aware. Number five, Jeb Stewart, James Ewell Brown. Interestingly enough, he was involved in the Civil War before the Civil War started. He was uh, involved in the capture of John Brown and Harper's Ferry. And he was serving under a uh, colonel named Robert E. Lee at that time. And interestingly enough, he had also fought against John Brown in Kansas. When they finally captured John Brown, Brown and Harper's Ferry, and uh, Stuart talked to John Brown and said, wait, aren't you the guy that's causing all my problems, all those problems in Kansas? And indeed, he was the same. He successfully fought in the Battle of First World War.